to God be the glory. Let me mention just a few more things about Galatians before we leave. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has troubled you that you should not obey the truth? Once again, it's in this book, God says you've got to, you got to, you got to fight for what's right. You, 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 you can't step aside. You, you, can't, you can't step back. Dear friends, when the gospel's under assault, we must take a stand. That's why, again, in Galatians 5, verse 1, he says, Stand fast. Therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, be not entangled therein with the yoke of bondage. In Galatians 6, here's what happens to the brother who's fallen away, who has given up, who has lost his fight. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a trespass, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. So if there is someone who's lost, his way, what is your job? Bring him back. Restore him. And then he says, of course, verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. And then we go down into verse number 7, be not deceived, God's not mocked. Remember, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6 and 16 reminds us once again about the beauty of redemption For here God says, and as many as walk according to the rule, peace on them and mercy upon the Israel of God. Friends, he was talking about the church of Christ. Because again, the church of Christ is the Israel of God. Going all the way back to the covenants God made in the Old Testament. Now let's keep going. The book of Ephesians is the book of compliance. Now Ephesians is a book that says the church must be in compliance with Christ. And so it's an emphasis on the church. For example, Ephesians 1, and 23, where God has made him to be the head. He's the head of the church, the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And so then we go to chapter 5, where the husband is the head of the wife. Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of the body. And so as wives are in subject to their own husbands, so let, no, as, so let us be in subjection to Christ. As Christ is again over the church, and so as husbands are in the headship of their wife, Christ is in the headship of the church, and the church is submitting to Christ. And so Ephesians is a book about compliance. The church needs to listen to the Lord. He's in authority. He's in charge. I want you to notice something else about Ephesians. Friends, the book of Ephesians reminds us about the purpose of the church. In verse number 9, 10, and 11, he reminds us to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery from the beginning of the world. God started this in the beginning. Friends, the church is not something that God just thought of in the spare time or as a mistake or as a backup plan. The church was in the mind of God in the beginning who created all things by Jesus Christ to this intent that now, under the principalities and powers in heavenly places, it might be made known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. It's the job of the church to make known to the world the wisdom of God. It's the church's job to teach the lost, to go into the world. Look at verse 11. Notice, according to his eternal purpose. Friends, God didn't come up with the church of Christ in the book of Matthew. He didn't come up with the church of Christ in the book of Acts. He came up with the church of Christ in Genesis chapter 1. He reveals that plan in the Edemic covenant in Genesis 3. So once again, in every book of the Bible, he's reminding us of the unity, of the beauty of the text, according to his eternal purpose. The church of the living God is the emphasis in this book, and the church needs to listen to Jesus. There is one body. The body is the church of Christ. And that church is where people are saved because he is the savior of that body. Let's go to the next book, the book of Philippians. Philippians is the book of cheerfulness. It's one of the joyous books of scripture. If you're having a hard time, a difficult day, my advice, read the book of Philippians. You cannot help but be encouraged. You can almost 
feel the passion and the love Paul had for this church when you just open it up and read the first few verses. Look at verse 3. He says, I thank God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel for the first day until now. In other words, you give me joy. In Philippians, he says, you have given me great joy because you have helped me, prayed for me, supported me, and been faithful to God. It's in Philippians, we have the recipe for joy. We have the recipe for blessedness. If you want to change your mood, if you want to overcome a, a, a difficult time in your life, if you're just feeling depressed, I mean, read this book. You can't help but be encouraged. Look at verse chapter 2. If there be any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any bowels of mercy, fulfill ye my joy. So it's a book about joy. How do you do that? Be like-minded, have the same love, be of one accord. Let this mind be you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So have the mind of, 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 of Christ. And then he goes on and says further, verse 14, do all things without murmuring. Don't be complaining all the time. And so he just emphasizes this all through the book. There are recipes for joy everywhere in Philippians. Let me give you a couple more. Chapter 3, verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing, one thing I do. Here's, if you had one thing to do, what would it be? He says, forget the things that are behind, reach forth for the things that are before, press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If you had one thing to do, he said, that's what you need to focus on. Then in chapter four, don't be anxious. Verse number six, but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. In verse four, he said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. It's a book of cheerfulness. And if you're suffering, if you're anxious, then lay that on God in prayer. But in your prayer, be thankful. Then he says in verse eight, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, if there's any praise, you think on these things. How do you get out of that negative mindset? You think on those things. Then he says, those things which you have both heard, learned, and received in me do, for the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Notice this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Verse 19. Friends, the entire book is upbeat. Philippians, the book of cheerfulness. Colossians is the book of control. Now, Ephesians is the sister book of Colossians. When you read Ephesians and Colossians, you lay them side by side, there's some duplication, but they're not identical. Where Ephesians emphasizes the church being in compliance to Christ, so the emphasis is on the church, Colossians emphasizes that Christ is over the church. He's in control. And so the emphasis is on Christ, where the emphasis in Ephesians was on the church. Let's look at Colossians 1 and verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He is in first place. He is the head of the church. So Colossians is emphasizing it from the standpoint of Jesus. And he does this in every chapter. For example, chapter 2. For in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So in Jesus dwells it all. He's in control. And so we move through chapter 3. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Now, that's significant for two reasons. First, Jesus is in control. He sits on the right hand of God. Friends, do you know what he's sitting on? The throne of David. Remember again, 2 Samuel 7. We remember Luke chapter 1. And once again, we see it here in Colossians 3. Every book of the Bible refers to redemption. Jesus is reigning over his kingdom, the church of Christ. He's sitting on his throne. He's in control. He has the authority. See, 
Colossians is a book that emphasizes that very fact. Now let's go to the book of 1 Thessalonians. Some believe that 1 Thessalonians may have been the earliest or even the first epistle written. Well, it kind of makes sense because it really looks like a new convert's letter. In 1 Thessalonians, you have a church that's struggling with the concept of Jesus coming again. Get ready to mark these passages. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 10, or excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath of come. Now I want you to mark these. Every chapter talks about the coming of Christ. In chapter 1, they're told to wait for the son from heaven because he's coming. Then in chapter 2, he says in verse number 19, for what is our hope or even joy or crown or rejoicing are not ye even in the presence before our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Then you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and notice this, verse 13, to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. Then chapter 4, we could go to verse number 13, but I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them that are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which asleep in Jesus will God bring with them. Look at verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's why I call it the comforting coming. Because the emphasis is not only on the coming of Jesus, but friends, you should not be afraid if you're a faithful Christian of Jesus coming. If you're fearful that Jesus is coming, could you be afraid because you're not ready? Because you're not living faithfully? See, for the faithful, friends, the coming of the Lord should be something that comforts your heart. In every chapter of this book, he's emphasizing Jesus is coming, and it should give you joy. You should rejoice. You should be comforted. Look at chapter 5. Here it is again, where he mentions the comfort that we get from Jesus who's coming. You go to verse number 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. Verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warm that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Then we go to verse number 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray, God, that your own spirits, body, soul, be preserved blameless until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no doubt this book is about the coming that comforts us of Jesus. But friends, you know what happens if you're not ready? You know what happens if you've not obeyed the gospel? The coming of the Lord is not very comforting. In fact, it's frightening. In chapter 1, he says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, taking vengeance on them, notice this, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and obey not the gospel of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might when he shall come to be glorified in his saints, to be admired of all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Friends, if you're not ready, if you've not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you're not leaving faithful to God, the coming of the Lord is not comforting, it's consequential. See, both books are about the coming of the Lord. One comforts you, and the other is consequential to you. It's all really about how you're living. Both of these books, great for new converts. They're great for those of us who've been Christians for years. They remind us of the judgment of God and our responsibility to be faithful. Let's go to the epistles of Timothy, or the letters that Paul wrote. First Timothy is about conduct. How should you conduct yourself in the house of God? Well, I'd underline chapter 3 and verse number 15. But I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself, Timothy, in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. He writes this letter to Timothy. So Timothy and the brethren were to know how they should behave, how they should live, how they should conduct themselves in the church of Christ. Now in 2 Timothy, that letter is written so that Timothy will be constant in the gospel. He'll be unwavering. 
He says, Timothy, it's important that you preach the word. Did you be instant in season and out of season? Did you reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine? Timothy, it's important that you be strong in the grace that is in Christ. Timothy, it's important that you do in hardness as the elect's sake, that you endure that hardness, chapter 2, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 10. I mean, it goes through the whole book and says, Timothy, be constant. Now, Timothy's a young man. Paul says, not only should you behave yourself and teach the brethren how to behave in the church, Timothy, you must be unwavering. You must be faithful. You must be instant, in season and out of season. Preach the truth when the brethren want to hear it and when they don't want to hear it. You cannot move to the left or to the right, Timothy. I mean, these two books are, are, are great at teaching preachers how to be faithful to God and how to encourage members to be faithful to God. Let's look at that reference one more time in verse 15 of 1 Timothy 3. The house of God. Remember again 2 Samuel 7? He was going to build the house of God. And he was going to establish the throne of his kingdom. Friends, once again, there's your reference to redemption. The church is fulfilling the plan that God had made thousands of years ago. Let's keep going. Titus. Here's another letter written to a preacher. Paul says, Titus, I want you to go to the island of Crete, and I want you to complete the church. Well, the problem was that island of Crete, the church was incomplete. So in verse 5, it says, For this cause left I thee in Crete. Thou should have set in order the things that are lacking or wanting, and then ordain elders in every city as I've appointed thee. Well, they lacked the right kind of leadership in chapter 1, and Titus is told by Paul to complete that church. Find qualified men who can shepherd and bishop, they can oversee that flock. In chapter 2, they lack the right kind of teaching. And so he says, but speak those things which become healthy or sound doctrine. Verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men teaching us. Titus, complete the church with the right kind of teaching. Teaching us the denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present world. Chapter 3 says, develop the right kind of member. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers. Verse 1, to obey magistrates. Be ready to every good work. Make sure you understand it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, verse 5. But according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Verse 7, that we're being justified by His grace. We should be being heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So in Titus, complete the church. In the book of Philemon, he says, Christians need to be compassionate people. Philemon is the art of persuasion. It's the art of compassion. It's relationship building. It's how we treat our fellow man even when we're wrong. In verse number 10, Paul looks at Philemon, who had been wrong by Onesimus, but yet God delivered him back as a Christian. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, which I have begotten in my bonds. Philemon, I beseech you, receive him back. Be kind, be compassionate to him. Friends, even when we're wronged, we can suffer that wrong and we can use it for good. Let's go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is about the Old Testament. It's been done away with. Now we're under the New Testament. Time after time in the book of Hebrews, we're reminded that we're under a better covenant, better promises, a better priesthood. Everything's better in the New Testament. If you have a problem understanding the law of God and which law we live under, friends, read the book of Hebrews. Everything is made clear in this book regarding what law we live under and the great blessings we have because of it. Jesus is now the high priest. He is now our king of kings. He is now the Lord of lords. Go to chapter 8 and verse 13. And that he saith a new covenant, he has made the first old. Now which that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. And so he reminds us that the old law was for the purpose of bringing us to the new law. It was just a shadow. 
chapter 10, verse 1. It was not the image. They could not with those sacrifices, verse 3, which they offered year by year, make the comers there into perfect, for there was remembrance of sin. So we have a better law, better testament, the blood of Jesus that washes away our sins, and he remembers him no more. Let's go to the book of James. That's the book of continuance. James 2.24. You see then how by works a man is justified, not by faith only. It's the only time in the Bible where the term faith only is used, and it says it doesn't save. It says we're justified by the works and not by faith only. And so here, Hebrews was about the covenants. James is about continuance. James says, now that you understand you're under the new law, you've got to continue in it. Look at some other passages with me. Look at chapter 1, beginning in verse number 27. Pure religion. And then the five before God and the Father is to visit the fatherless and the widows and their afflictions to keep oneself unspotted from the world. James says, live right. Practice pure religion. And then when we get to James chapter 2, he reminds us that we must live out that faith and that God expects us to continue in it, be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer. That man shall be blessed in his deeds. Chapter 1, verse 22. Look at verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For hold, he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and immediately he forgets what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, notice this, and continueth. See the book of continuation. Be not a forgetful here, but a doer shall be blessed in his deed. James says, you must live the life. You must be faithful. You can't just say, well, I just believe in God and it's okay, and not continue. James says, you can't do that and please God. Look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter is the book of consolation. Friends, this is a message of hope for those struggling to cope. 1 Peter shows us how to deal with suffering. Let me just give you just a few passages. For example, verse number seven, that's a trial of your faith. Be much more precious than gold that perishes. Though be, treat, be tried with fire, might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Notice what he says, it's the trial of your faith. And he consoles you. He says, listen, if you're faithful, he'll try you and you'll be found with praise, glory, and honor. And so we've got to keep the faith when we're going through those difficult times. All the way through Peter, he's consoling those who are suffering. Notice in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse number 5, you're as a lively stone, built up a spiritual house. You're now a holy priesthood. Now let's stop. Remember the priesthood in Leviticus? established with Israel, really was a preview of the real priesthood that was coming. For in the priesthood of believers, once again, revealing the true intent of Leviticus was preparations for the true priesthood where Jesus is the high priest. And now he says, we are in the priesthood of believers and we can offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Look at verse 9. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Remember the nation promise? Well, now you're the nation. The church of Christ is the nation of God. What beautiful passages and verses that help us see the fulfillment of that which God began in the Old Testament. He says, now, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, you abstain from flesh and lust at war against the soul. And you submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. And so it says, this is the will of God that it is well with you. In doing so, you put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And don't use your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as servants of God. You honor all men. Servants, be subject to your masters. For this is think worthy and worthy of all acceptation. If a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, you see, even when you suffer wrongfully, he said, that doesn't give you the right to 
be spiteful, mean and malicious. And so as they were suffering, he consoles them. He says, listen, I know that you might suffer in this world wrongfully, but be faithful to God. And I love this at the end of chapter two. For even here unto where you call, because Christ suffered too, leaving us an example that we should walk in his footsteps. He suffered wrong. But what did he do? He did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. But he committed himself to the judge that's righteous, who in his own bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. He consoles the suffering saints. In 2 Peter, he says, be cautious. See, there were false teachers in the first century, just like there's false teachers today. He says, brethren, be careful. Look at chapter 2 and verse number 1. But there were false prophets among the people, even as there are false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Second Peter is a book that's warning us about false teachers, that they're real, and that we must be looking for them, and that we must resist them. And remember, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation, but He has reserved the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. He reminds Christians that they were in danger and even could lose their faith if they followed a false teacher. Look at chapter 2, verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worth with them than the beginning. Let's go to the last few books of the Scripture. First John, that's a book of communion. How do you commune with the Lord? If you want fellowship with the Lord, you've got to walk in the light as He is in the light. And you have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all righteousness. 1 John is the book of communion, but it also be called the book of charity. That's another word for love, because in 1 John, he says, God is love. And he helps us understand the love of God means that we obey him. It also means that we treat our brethren with compassion. It's a book of how to commune with God. It means you love your brethren. If you want to have a relationship with God, you live right, and you love your brethren, and you treat them correctly. Let's go quickly to 2 John. 2 John is a book about the commandment. What is the commandment? The commandment is Jesus is the Son of God. And I want you to look at verse 9. Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ, they have not God. You see, if you don't stay in that teaching, you don't have God anymore. Look at verse number five. Now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment. Friends, this isn't new. Look at this. Unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, you love one another. I know 1 John mentions love frequently, but friends, all the epistles and letters that John writes, love is mentioned over and over again. I'll call this book the book of commandment because he mentions it several times. Notice verse 4, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received the commandment. And in fact, let's just go back a little bit more. Look at verse 1. I love the truth. Underline that word. Notice this, all they that have the truth, verse 1. Verse 2, for the truth's sake. Notice verse 4, walking in the truth, we have a commandment. Verse 5, I wrote a new commandment. Verse 6, this is love that we walk after is commandments. Verse 6, this is the commandment. The truth, the commandment, it's emphasized over and over again. Notice it's harmonized with love. Friends, you cannot separate love from commandment. They're together. That's 2 John. And whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ, you don't have God. But he that abides in the doctrine of Christ, you have both the Father and the Son. Let's go to 3 John. 3 John is the book about commendation. In 3 John, he commends those who are doing well. He commends them, first two. Beloved, I wish and pray that all things, that thou mayest prosper and be in good health as thy soul prosperous. And he commends Gaius, whom I love in the truth. 
And so 3 John is a book of commendation to those that were doing well. Let's go to Jude. It's a book of contending. Brother, we need to contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. Jude says, we need to stand firm in faith. Don't, don't be wavering. I know it's only one chapter, but brethren, it's a powerful book. It reminds us that we are to keep ourselves in the love of God and look for the mercies of the Lord. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless. Verse 21 says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Contend for the faith. Now let's go to our last book. It's the book of Revelation. That's the book of the crown. It's really not hard to understand. Be faithful unto death, and you receive the crown of life. And so Revelation, at the end of the Bible, reminds us that we need to keep that which we've learned, and we'll be rewarded if we are. Those 27 books encapsulate redemption, and they let us see Jesus in His fullness, in His beauty. They help us appreciate the love of God, the salvation of Jesus Christ. We see the big picture. We see the cross. It's more than just 27 individual books. We've really got one purpose and one theme. Friends, we may never, may we never forget that. And always hold it firm. Hold on to it. Teach it to others. Now that we understand the overview of the New Testament, we can look at those books individually and even fill more of our puzzle in. Get a greater understanding of the redemption of Jesus Christ.